So one thing I started with that's fun is what the hardest thing I started. I actually started with the hardest thing first because I thought, eh, that, eh, you know, it probably won't help. That probably won't work, but work your way down until you get something. The thing I've always lived my whole life and you hear people talk about all the time is like AI can't replicate people and you need people. The human has to be in the loop. The person has to be, you need that human touch and understanding of the business and, and the customer and uh, these kind of qualitative things. Right. But the reality is, is with LLMs. And I think, you know, my, my kids used to, to create screenplays, um, great jokes, uh, music, um, it's actually better at that work than it is rote repetitive testing of the login screen, right? And such. So, so what the AI is doing here and can do is, uh, I mean, people use, you know, uh, this is entire businesses around this, where you have human beings go look at your website and give you their opinion. And it's a diverse opinion. Um, and they give you, you know, qualitative feedback on your advice, like your, your site doesn't look good. It's confusing, those kind of meta things. Things we always thought that computers could never do, and they do really good at it. So one of the so they'll create panels like people that are relevant to that app. So the AI can grow. You can just ask a chat GPT, go, hey, create some profiles of users for this app, right? And it will generate them. And then you can say, what would they feel about this page? Right. And they it tells you. And the funny thing is I did a first experiment on Google, on the Google page, just because that's the simplest thing on the page on the planet-ish. And everyone knows it too. And so I did, the, I did the ask the panel what they thought of the, the Google page. And I expected tens to come back, like 10 out of 10 on everything, right? Because it's super clean, fast, simple. Everyone just figures out how to use it. And the first panelist I looked at said two things. One, the site looks very sterile, like not very personal. Like it didn't feel an, didn't feel an emotional attachment to the page. Well, that's kind of weird, right? And I go like, oh, it is kind of sterile and for engineers and nerds. Um, and then secondly, it said, hey, I don't know about the privacy. I don't understand the privacy implications of doing a search. And it says, yes, there is a there's a link at the bottom talking about privacy. But when I land on the page, I don't understand. I don't get a good feeling for that. I don't quite trust it. And even when I go to the, uh, the, the uh, privacy or terms of service page, guess what it says? A whole bunch of legalese and there's a bunch of things to click on. And it's confusing, right? Um, and partly on purpose. So... So I think those are, even like Google.com can improve uh, with feedback from synthetic users. Uh, so I think that was pretty interesting. Uh, and ironically, that was the easiest thing to get to do. I was in an experiment. Um, I'm trying to share learning so that people can take off and go, oh, you're an idiot, Jason. Uh, you did it wrong or that's that's uh, whatever. But I just want to share with the community. So the voices of the community, I'm trying to share what I've been hacking on. Some of those stuff I've blogged about before but or put on LinkedIn or something or Medium. But um, trying to share and see if people have feedback or thoughts or they can do a better version of it or something. So I built this thing as an extension. That's where I, that's what I did for my Christmas holiday. Um, and uh, the idea was it would scan the page and it would tell the user like, hey, there's a bunch of test cases that you could try, like interesting test cases, like edge test cases, um, security, performance, whatever. And it would just, just, it wouldn't even do them. It would just say, hey, these are things to check out, right? But the funny thing is, um, not a lot of people seem to be very, very interested in it. And maybe it's because of me, but I don't, I don't think there was just kind of an anemic response. And then even the people that did use it, people that, that wanted it, that asked for it, maybe only like 10 or 20, maybe like 15% of them, I think, uh, downloaded it and installed it. Um, but only that, that percentage of them and the ones that installed it, even the ones that were like super like, um, how do I say it? Like, a, you know, testers that are very vocal or visible in the community and stuff. Um, they looked at it for like a minute. I like literally, and I'm not, I don't have any ego in it. Um, I'm actually like the, the real data was that like, they just weren't interested. And I'm like, they're like, Hey, yeah, I tried it. And it wasn't, it didn't do that much. It wasn't that useful. I'm like, okay, well, what'd you do? And first of all, so they didn't spend a lot of time with it. Like you think if someone's testing a tool with AI that could change the way they work, they might take five minutes. <laughs> Um, but what they did was they would download it and they would look at it and they would say, um, you know, oh, like, okay, the edge bot suggested some edge test cases. And I'd be like, okay, were they interesting? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, would you have thought of those? And they said, no. And I'm like, okay, so we've got a tool that tells a tester about edge cases they wouldn't have thought of that are interesting. That, that, that to me, the fact that it's not interesting is interesting. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with the, 
A, testers feel a little bit threatened by stuff. They don't want the technology to be useful um, because of job security and, and people don't generally like change. And secondly, um, they're testers. Like they don't want to think or believe the new technology works. They think they're professional skeptics um, um, by design. Um, and then lastly, um, you know, I think they don't want to be dependent on a machine or admit that the machine's done something that they couldn't have done just personally as a human. And I think this is replicating a little bit across other areas. Um, but what that means ultimately, a big thing I think I can share here is, is uh, by, when I say I can, I think I can, I'm, I don't have 100% proof that this is true. But I believe that um, this is widespread kind of about AI adoption is that you, the, the people that AI can assist probably won't adopt it really quickly, but the people who pay for or consume the output of that work will readily pay for it because they, they can just get the solution without the person. Um, so I think it really, in terms of kind of voices, the community theme here today, um, I think testers should really try to embrace um, AI and think how it can improve their, their work, but don't be shy about it. Don't be timid. Um, and if realize that if you are timid, somebody else is going to just do it without you in the loop. So I highly recommend that testers that want to stay in the loop, get in the loop. That's a long way to say it. Um, another thing that AI can do that's pretty cool is it can look at your web app and just generate user flows. Like, hey, this is a person, this is a bio of a person. This is what they want to do with your website. And this is what their goal is. Uh, you don't have to sit there and brainstorm and think about it and whiteboard, you know, these, these brainstorm sessions and things. Um, it'll just generate very legitimate user flows. Um, and here's something that's very exciting, very exciting to me at least in the history of test automation is that uh, um, this is a quick video. I don't know why the person's falling on their face with a book. Oh, they're studying or something. Um, what you've seen here is the command line is just test and then you pass the URL of google.com. That's all you do to the AI and you pass that to it. And guess what it does? It launches, it launches the web page, it creates a persona and profile. Uh, creates the test cases related to that person. Um, it creates both a tester and it creates a user persona for the test case to justify the test case as well. Um, and then guess what it does? It starts executing the test. <laughs> like if this isn't interesting to you, you probably I don't think should be in, in software testing. This is the, this is the, this is a watershed moment. I think it's similar to that Devin video, right? Except it actually did what it did <laughs> and did what it was supposed to do. Um, now I can't, I'm still working to make sure they can do very long workflows and test cases. And, and there's a lot of testing work still to be done, but, um, but this worked before I thought it would actually work. Um, and there's no Selenium involved. There's no Java involved. There's no hard coding of anything involved. Uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. The AI is actually just taking control of the browser and doing what it wants to do with it. Um, so that doesn't excite you again, uh, in the wrong business, probably. Um, the AI can find bugs. You can do this. You can copy paste a little bit of HTML or something into GPT and say, are there any bugs? And it will tell you. And you know, some percentage of them are hallucinations, and but a lot of them are correct. But the cool thing is, is it can find bugs in a wide swath of areas. Usually you'd have to have a separate tool or a separate vendor or a separate person to, to test security, accessibility, um, uh, functionality, performance, um, a wasp stuff, you name it, right? All these different types of testing that we do um, is a different person, a different expert, a different vendor, and you have to like coordinate all these things. And even if the one person could do it all, they're serialized on it, right? But in the cool thing of AI, you can do them all in parallel. So the same thing is gonna radically change how testing happens because it's gonna be, it's gonna lead to a, a quick convergence of all testing because uh, you don't need to put together a giant package, kind of like the days of um, of uh, Mercury, where you can buy one thing and it does most of everything you need instead of what we do piecemeal today. Um, AI can also test network and API stuff, API calls. We go, what does that mean, right? Well, um, not only can it, you can look at the network traffic, right? But it can also, and this is a horrible example because this app doesn't have any bugs on it. Genius, Arvin. Anyway. Um, it can look at all the API calls and say, hey, you're passing some data in the clear, right? Like a privacy issue. Or you could say, hey, um, you know, you're mixing, you know, different content modes or you're doing um, anything really that's different with with um, with API calls. So the idea is if you can take a network stack 
avoider calls, copy paste it in GPT and say, are there problems? It can actually tell you there's problems pretty often, more often than not. Or it tells you it's good. Uh, but it's looking for things. And the key thing here is too, is things you didn't even know to ask to find, which is very different modality. The other big thing I think is going to happen, and this goes back to the scale. So when we, we need new ways to test, right? And I think part of that is not just how do we execute the test, but how do we know if it's good enough? How do you know if something's good enough for production? A lot of times we think that as humans, we need to be there to look at the test results and say, okay, you know, we're at 72.5% pass rate. We're good to go, right? Which is completely arbitrary. Uh, well, that's for another story. But to say that was even legit. How do you do it without a, without humans in the loop? Well, the cool thing is because you have scale with AI for the first time, because you don't have to have a tester for every app to automate all these things manually, right? The AI can go and test all those apps. So when you do that, guess what your baseline is for quality? It's the other apps. So I think AI means scale, which really means this kind of relative qualitative measure of quality. And so in, in today, if you went to your team, on your own team, say you went back and said, hey, you know, to your management and said, hey, our, we need to work on performance because our, our page load time is 3.2 seconds. Guess what everybody does? They go, well, whatevs. How does that affect the business? How do you know it affects the business? Great. We'll get to that later. We've got four features in the queue that might make us money, right? And, um, but what happens if you go back and tell them and say, hey, we're 3.2 seconds on page load time, but all of our competitors are under two seconds like our direct competitors. Now management cares. Now they know there's a problem. Now they understand that it's a, it's a, a competitive issue. So you're changing the, the metrics to a competitive and, and a, a metric that would motivate um, management to care uh, to fix these issues. Um, so I think this is going to dramatically change our test. Not just can the AI test and, and baseline and benchmark itself because of scale, but that scale also is a far better output than um baseline metrics or a JIRA report. Um, I think it's worth to say, I think people are doing it backwards. This isn't my opinion. People are like trying to take an existing app and then put the, um, you know, and the human stuff and then fine tune it with, with AI. I think the inverse is actually what's going to happen, which is that um, the AI does a bunch of stuff, but then the human comes in where they can and they add their own expertise. Like, hey, robots, we're trying to get this out by Friday. Don't worry about performance. Just tell us if there's ship stopping stuff, right? Or you can say, hey, there's a new feature. Um, and the AI, by the way, recognizes a new feature without having to be told, which is awesome. But you can say, here's just focus on this one feature, for example, or this one thing we're trying to resolve in this build, um, if it doesn't know that context. But humans will refine what the AI does, not the other way around. Not like the humans do stuff and the AI refines or optimizes or repairs what the humans did. The AI can also, we know ChatGPT, um, keep using that example, but actually I use, um, I use a lot of different ones right now. Uh, I particularly appreciate the context length and the price of uh, Claude, uh, Hi Claude Haiku model right now, by the way. There's one thing you get out of this is actionable advice, like uh, um, uh, is is uh, is to use Claude Haiku. It's, it's a super fast, almost on par with GPT, Definitely as good as 3.5, probably close to 4, but it's fast. Anyway, and cheap. The, uh, um, but the point here is that you can take all the data we've looked at and gathered, and you can give it to the AI, and you can ask it, like, grade this app based on all this data, the competitive data, the performance, all this stuff. Give it a grade, right? And give it a summary. Give a quick summary. This is the short one, but it can generate paragraph. It can generate a one-pager report that talks about all the quality issues and how good or bad the app is and what should be worked on with a justification with no human involved, right? Like that's pretty crazy. And what that looks like is not a tester's job, not just like a, uh, hey, we need to test the login feature or we need to test performance or something. It's this is like a test lead or a test manager or director kind of a testing um, level of value add. So again, people keep talking about the last most important thing is going to be that human touch to summarize what the AI has done or whatever. I think it's the opposite. I think the summarization is going to be the easiest thing. Uh, the hardest thing is to get all the detail and edge cases and all those kind of things done. Um, so again, we're seeing a breadth of, of AI first approaches to all these testing problems. Um, 
and and without humans in the loop. And they're they're plausible today. My main point is these things are plausible. They're executable. They're demonstrable um, today.